tremendous morning. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. A nice round of applause for Mira Loma and Gail Ranch, our two champions. My favorite answer of the morning was passion fruit and black walnut. Right now we're going to announce the winners of the Challenge Science Activity. Those schools that came in first in their divisions, in the Division Team Challenge Science Activity, all of you will be receiving $500 for science supplies for your schools. I'd like you to stand in your place, please, when we call your name. Our first winner from Ames High School, from Ames, Iowa. First place ranking in the chemistry activity, you're getting warmer in the Arrhenius division. Ames High School, where might you be? There they are. Good job. First place for the earth science activity, the answer is blowing in the wind for the Bromery division, is Ridgeview High School from Fort Collins, Colorado. Ridgeview. There they are in their green shirts. Terre Haute South Vigo High School from Terre Haute, Indiana, placed first in the Curie Division Earth Science Activity. What's the story? Home of Joseph Botros, our most ever contestant here on Science Bowl. Congratulations, Terre Haute. The first place team in the Darwin Division's biology activity, passionate about passive diffusion, is Mission San Jose High School from Fremont, California. There they are. The physics activity, Hey What's Shaken, required students in the Einstein Division to determine the inertial mass of an object. Our winner, congratulations, the top ranked team, Blue Valley High School, Stillwell, Kansas. There they are. Good one, guys. Hunter College High School from New York City placed first in the Fermi Division contest, in which teams estimated answers to a variety of general science questions. Hunter College High School, where might you be? Right up front. The first place team for the astronomy activity looking good for the Galileo Division is Enterprise High School from Redding, California, right back there. And our last honoree, Sunset High School from Portland, Oregon, received the first place ranking in the Hypatia Division on the mathematics activity, tiling the plane with regular polygons. One of our competitors this morning, Sunset High School from Portland. There they are. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to the Director of the Office of Science, Dr. William Brinkman. Dr. Brinkman, let me tell you just a little bit about him. He's a role model in so many ways. He's a physicist, he's a manager, a researcher, a technologist, and an athlete. But he is perhaps best known as being living proof of that age-old advice of being nice to people, especially your employees, when you are riding high yourself. You see, during Dr. Brinkman's 35-year career at Bell Labs, one of his scientists in the 1970s in the Chemical Physics Research Lab was one Stephen Chu, who would go on to win a Nobel Prize and in a reversal of authority is now Dr. Brinkman's boss here at the Department of Energy. Dr. Brinkman's story is straight out of the American heartland and Horatio Alger, son of a proud Missouri farmer who never made it past the eighth grade Dr. Brinkman grew up with his two sisters along the Mississippi River. He owes his collegiate career to the insistent urging of his mother, who wanted her children to experience more than the little town of Geneva, Missouri. Dr. Brinkman parlayed his athletic skills as a high school football player into a scholarship at the University of Missouri. And even though his real loves were mathematics and physics, it was football that paid the bills, so Bill put on the shoulder pads ahead of the cyclotron. Graduate school and a doctorate followed at Missouri and a National Science Foundation postdoc fellowship at Oxford, and then it was on to Bell Labs. After retiring from Bell Labs and working as a physicist at Princeton, 
Bill was tapped by President Obama to run the Department of the Office of Science at the Department of Energy, the largest provider of basic science research in this country with $4.8 billion in its budget. His concern for keeping America a leading nation in science, engineering, and technology expresses itself best in his desire to improve educational opportunities and develop attractive career paths for today's students like you, hence his appearance at today's National Science Bowl. Maybe it all started when he was a tutor for the football players on his team who knew a great resource when they saw it. I hope they tipped Bill well. And it, it, Bill, is, Bill is with the secretary in, in the television business. When they do this, they say stretch. They stay stretch. So, you know, even though you have three minutes to do your weather forecast, sometimes you just got to pedal a little bit more. Dr. Chu is going to be very happy to hear that he featured in one of the questions this morning about riding his bicycle in a vertical uh, loop. We'll see if he really does that. Some of you, if you Google Dr. Chu on Chuck Chu online, will notice that uh, he has appeared oftentimes in the newspaper, most recently here in Washington back in November, when there was a picture of him riding his bicycle to work. Dr. Chu cycles to work every day, to the great amusement, I'm sure, of his Secret Service detail. And he regularly breaks the speed limit as he goes down the Capitol Crescent Trail, which is the main one here in town that's always crowded, but I'm sure they make room for him. So he goes through Washington, and if you've been noticing as you've been driving around town, there are special bike lanes everywhere. They continue to grow in popularity. So he is setting a really green, a good green example for all of his other employees. I don't know if he makes, does he make all the rest of you bike to work as well, Jen? Not yet. That's coming. Wait till wait till you see that next memo. I know last year Dr. Chu sat right down here in front and along with the First Lady was asking the questions and both he and the First Lady had done their homework. They never made any mistakes. And of course with Dr. Chu you wouldn't expect him to, but the First Lady too really came across as someone who had done her homework and we were delighted to have her the first time ever we had a First Lady at Science Bowl. And now I've been singing your praises, Dr. Brinkman, and telling the audience that Dr. Chu was in one of our questions recently. Ladies and gentlemen, a great guy from Missouri, Dr. William Brinkman. Good afternoon. Well, before introducing the secretary, I, I want to acknowledge the death of Sue Ellen uh, Walbridge, along with the, er, the earlier homage that was paid to her this morning. I offer my confer personal condolence to her family. Uh, Sue Ellen started the Science Bowl. I don't know how many of you realize that. She started the Science Bowl 20 years ago and was in charge of it until this year. This is really remarkable. 20 years she ran this very successfully. She always did an excellent job seeing that all the details were managed efficiently, efficiently and with care. For her work, she was nominated as a finalist for the Service of America Medal for outstanding contributions to, to the activities of the federal government. It was a real privilege for her to win, uh, be considered that highly. Sue Ellen's spirit is with us today, and we hope she is proud of all the work that has been done this year and all the work that you all have done in preparing for this uh, event. So I acknowledge her uh, and offer condolences to the family. Today is my privilege to introduce to you Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu. You know, Stephen is really a scientist at heart. He, uh, he, he, he loves science. Uh, I always remember the day, debate we had uh, back at Bell Laboratories when we, tried, we hired Steve Chu out of college. Um, it was a funny debate because we all sat around and we said, boy, this guy is really smart. But he's working on particle physics at Bell Laboratories. We <laughs> couldn't quite figure out that that was the kind of physics that we would want to do in an industrial environment. And so anyway, his intelligence won out. And, and that's, that's all part of history now. And he became a, a famous guy for his science and, and for it as a director of energy. Um, He's, he's always seemed to make science fun. That's one of the things I loved about, love about Steve. In his career, he took the, uh, took the progress of his inventions and discoveries 
and was always thinking of new ways to, uh, to, use, to use these inventions to do new science. And it didn't matter to him what field it was in. It didn't matter if it was biology, atomic physics, particle physics, even cosmology at one stage. So it was always impressive that he could do such a broad spectrum of things. And of course, this work was recognized uh, for the, for, uh, with a the Nobel Prize for cooling atoms, which, by the way, he did at Bill Laboratories. <laughs> um, in the last six years, he has become an outstanding driver behind solving the country's energy problems, whether it is inventing new pro uh, programs for biofuels, working with BP on, on, to contain the oil spill, or helping the Japanese at the Fukushima re uh, nuclear reactors. He has, he has uh, become influential in Washington way beyond what any previous Secretary of Energy has, and, and, more, and very deservingly so. So I just I want to give you Steve Chu. Thank you, Bill, for that. Uh, Nice introduction. Um, what you don't know, and I should tell you that um, he was my boss's boss when I was hired at Bell Laboratories. I had been a graduate student at Berkeley and a postdoc at Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and uh, they 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 did hire me. I was officially a faculty member at Berkeley at that time, and they didn't really know what to do with me. And so they said, uh, Steve, what we'd like you to do is don't rush in. And do something automatically, why don't you spend six months and think about what you'd like to do, talk to people, go to the library, uh, et cetera, which they didn't know at the time was totally unnerving <laughs> because, um, you know, of course I had ideas of what I wanted to do, but, but they were what they were really trying to do is make sure that I would broaden my appetite for all the wonderful things that were happening at Bell Laboratories and don't do some experiment in high energy physics. So anyway, but uh, here I am today. Uh, so he, he actually also lived down the street from, from me uh, at Bell Laboratories and became uh, over the many years, this is now 1978 till now, uh, a close personal friend. Um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here. I also want to acknowledge the incredible legacy of Sue Ellen Walbridge uh, and all the work she has done in the Department of Energy, particularly with the Science Bowl. Um, I want to congratulate all the people that are here today, not only the winners, but of course everybody, because in order to get to this point, uh, you must have been very, very good. I hope it was all fun for you uh, to be part of this. Um, I think you know, going forward in the future, uh, our country needs people like you. You know, bright young students, with genuine interest in science. Uh, these, you will be the future leaders and make the discoveries we will need going forward in order to uh, remain prosperous in the 21st century, in order to uh, do the things that we, and solve the problems that we will need solved. Uh, but I will also go on and what Bill Brinkman has told you. Also remember, it's fun. It's genuinely fun. And um, if I look back on my life um, and realize how lucky I've been, because I would, for the first 30, 35 years of my life, I was doing something, if you start the clock, let's say when I was a graduate student, maybe 40 years of my life, I was doing something uh, where it was so much fun, I would lose track of what time it was, literally. This has not happened rarely. This happened so often that my wife got very irritated at me, where she would call me up, it's 9 p.m., it's dark outside, and said, are you coming home? You know, you, you forget to eat. <laughs> uh, sometimes, uh, you can't forget to sleep, but sometimes you can... You can do these things. And, and to have a job where it's so much fun, you actually lose track of the time, that you're so involved in what you're doing, uh, where, you know, in some weird sort of way, um, uh, until I became director of a national laboratory, I didn't really want to take vacations. 
okay, Christmas. <laughs> but, but, you know, two or three days here and there, fine. But, but otherwise, you know, hey, you know, the, what I was doing in my research, what I was doing uh, with the students we had was so much fun that it was something that I just looked forward to, not only doing this every day, but even when I went home or thinking about it. And, and that infection of doing something you really care about and you like so much, your job is your hobby, is something you should all think about and strive for. Uh, it's something wonderful. So I, I can go on and on about, uh, about things, but I'd rather not. I've been told the less I talk, the more I can interact with you. So I think with that, you know, that uh, I applaud your interest in science. I hope you continue. It's going to be hard work, but it will be incredibly fun if you should stay in science or engineering or any of these areas. But with that, uh, am I allowed to take questions? I think um, so. I'll throw it open to anyone who wants to ask questions. Hello, my name is Alexis uh, Rivero from Puerto Rico. And I'm just wondering, what is the, uh, the United States' stance on nuclear energy at the moment, and whether we're going to okay, have the supposed nuclear renaissance that was supposed to happen? Well, we, we still think that uh, there is a place for nuclear energy in this century in the United States. Uh, right now, we, we uh, generate 20% of our electricity from nuclear energy. And, um, you know, the, uh, the Fukushima, uh, a very unfortunate disaster that is happening has happened at Fukushima certainly uh, is going to affect us. We, we are going to look back and make sure uh, that our nuclear reactors are operating in a safe way and any lessons that we will learn, we will go forward. But one should also realize that if you think back in the last couple of years, we've had a terrible gas accident and a fire in California. Um, uh, gas recovery has environmental risks that we have to make sure that we can extract a, a gas, natural gas in the United States in a safe way. We had a terrible environmental disaster with the Macondo oil spill. We, we, you know, we had a coal mining tragedy. And if you just look at what happened in the last few years, you realize that um, uh, there, there are these dangers and we have to learn from them. Uh, and and one hopes that uh, we just have to remain calm and don't panic uh, about what's going on. But we will make uh, from the lessons we learned from this incident, uh, uh, things will be safer. Uh, it's also an economic decision in that, um, as to whether one wants to invest in these reactors, and, and so the private sector is going to be doing that. But we still think it's part of uh, what we could be doing in this century to lower our carbon emissions. By the later half of this century, one hopes that renewable energies, wind and solar and things like that, uh, the price becomes competitive without any subsidy. We have a distribution system and a storage system that can accommodate that. But in the meantime, we'll need uh, these more traditional forms of energy. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to let you, the people with the microphones decide uh, who do. Hi, um, I'm Victoria from Lhasa in Texas. Do you still want us to paint our roofs white? Pardon? Do you still want us to paint our roofs white? No, I never said paint your roofs white. Let me, <laughs> what I said is that when it's time, it comes a time to either in homes or in buildings to replace a roof, that you should think of a light colored roof, a cool colored roof uh, in the sense, and white is very good for that. Um, actually taking white paint and painting your roof could do damage to your roof. And so that was interpreted to mean paint your roofs white. Uh, there's light colored tiles and things of that nature that, that uh, one can do because it, in, in any temperate climate or in hot climate, it, it keeps your home, the buildings uh, cooler uh, with less air conditioning and it uh, does a lot to reflect solar radiation back into space. So I'm still a big advocate of transitioning to light or white colored roofs, but not paint. <laughs> Okay, I mean, so, so light color roofs, yes. Yes. Uh, sir, may I shake your hand? <laughs> I suppose. 
that was <laughs> sir. <laughs> I was wondering what steps the um, Department of Energy is taking towards carbon neutral energy sources that would um, lower pollution in our environment. Oh, we're very focused on um, helping develop and deploy uh, low carbon emission sources, uh, wind, solar, energy. Uh, we also think that the electrification of vehicles is also a very big deal because that means because tailpipe emissions, carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions from a tailpipe are very hard to actually capture that carbon dioxide. But once you uh, have a car that runs on electricity, you can, you can make the generation of that electricity uh, a lot cleaner. So, so we, we, we invest a lot both in the research and the development and help with the deployment of these clean energy things. Let me give you one example. Um, or two examples. One would be in, in electrification. We have a very aggressive program in batteries uh, to help develop the next generation of batteries. We're, right now you're seeing the introduction of cars like the Chevy Volt, a plug-in hybrid. You see all electric vehicles, a Tesla, uh, but uh, a Nissan Leaf, where these, you can, for a, a more mass market vehicle like a Nissan Leaf, you can go about 100 miles. We think it within reach, one can develop batteries, perhaps five, six, seven years from today, uh, but where you can go 300, 400 miles, but uh, with maybe one half the volume and one third the cost. Uh, in a mass market vehicle, that would uh, really be dynamite. Um, we do a lot on photovoltaics. The price of generating electricity from solar cells is higher than fossil fuel. Uh, in the last five or six years, the price has decreased by 50%. We think that for sure the price can decrease by another 50% in the next decade, but we are seeing what can we do to help in research and development and uh, even further improvements to drop the price even further, perhaps by 75% within the next decade. And if you do that, that's a big deal because then the price of generating electricity, the all-in costs of the whole thing of generating electricity by using solar energy would be as cheap as any other form of electricity generation, whether it be natural gas or coal or you name it. And so, again, our goal is to drive the technology forward so it gets to a price point where it gets adopted not only in the United States, but all around the world. So this is a big deal in our program. There, in every sector, we're, we're looking at things like that. When do you think nuclear fusion will reach possible um, efficiencies? And um, what steps will the United States take to achieve this? Well, when is hard to predict, uh, because it not only has to achieve um, the scientific goals of nuclear fusion, but in all energy sources, the price is very important. So right now, the United States is collaborating with a consortium, an international consortium on a magnetic confined nuclear fusion project called ITER. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar project. It's five to eight plus million, billion dollars. Uh, it will take a dozen years or so uh, or actually longer than that, but the time scale of that, we're, it's now entered into uh, just beginning to start to build this, uh, but it is still a scientific experiment. And that is to say, can you get uh, fusion sustained long enough so the amount of energy you get out is much in excess of the amount, you know, 100 times or 400 times the amount of energy you put in. Uh, but the economic issues are still there, and but you, you can't tackle that until you find out whether it's possible. So, so we are investing in fusion, um, but I would say for the next couple of decades, it's not going to be part of our energy mix. Uh, and meanwhile, you have to look at all the other, and it may or may not come to pass. 
Uh, the fact that it's out there and it's a possibility is something, and that's why this consortium of international countries has decided to invest in this. But you also can't put all your eggs in that single basket. And uh, so you're going to – so we're looking at many of the other technologies as well. Um, as we go to the um – as we go to more renewable energy sources, will we have some kind of system for um, kind of like keeping the grid more stable? Because um, like a solar panel can start producing less electricity when like there's less solar output coming through the clouds, and there could be problems with wind. Like the uh, wind could be blowing uh, with less magnitude than usual. So would there be more like uh, systems to make the grid more stable? Well, first, our grid is stable. <laughs> there are no uh, blackouts of bright. Well, there are some, but uh, uh, but you you raise a very good point, a very important point, because a lot of the renewable energy, like wind, like solar, is variable. Clouds can roll by. The wind can stop blowing. And so, in order to go beyond, let's say, 20 or 30 percent renewable energy, you have to have a system that has a wide distribution network. So if it's not shining in this local area, you can pour energy from somewhere else. You also will need a system which can store some of the energy for later use, uh, either by pumping water in the dam a little bit higher or, or compressed air storage or batteries of various types. You also need to develop automatic mechanisms so that you can, in the first coming decades, turn on the fossil fuel generation very quickly and automatically so that if, in case the wind does stop blowing, you can ramp up, let's say, a gas turbine. So all of those things are part of this concerted effort as we transition to more and more renewables. But just as an aside, you know, there are countries already, for example, Ireland is now on average 20 percent wind, the rest fossil energy. Uh, that means that at the peak times, 40 percent of their electricity comes from wind. They think they want to get on average 40 percent wind. Now, we're, we're a much bigger country than Ireland, so we actually have better renewable energy resources. But, but certainly, countries are moving very actively in the, towards that. They're getting a higher and higher fraction of renewables, and yet you still want power there when you need it. So there would not be brownouts or blackouts. And so it's a very uh, – it's the entire system that has to be um, – looked at and this interplay between renewals and fossil and distribution and energy storage. And again, energy storage is another major technology we're investing in to drive down the cost to make it uh, much more cost effective. Uh, what do you think the future trend of oil will be in the next, say, 10 years? And how close are we to making some other viable transportation other than oil or gasoline? Well, if you look at the projections, that people are making with the fact of oil, uh, one is predicting that the developing world, notably first China, but then followed India and Mexico, many of the countries, as, as people gain wealth, uh, they will make higher demands on oil. And so the projections are, in fact, that the developing world, in fact, we're crossing over this today. If you look at the developed countries, like the so-called OECD countries in the United States, uh, their oil consumption is now being eclipsed by the developing countries. As one example, um, China sold about 16.7 million cars last year. Uh, we sold roughly 12 million cars in the United States. And so, so if one looks at that and those trends, uh, we expect that the demand for oil will increase mostly driven, almost exclusively driven by the developing countries. Then you also look at where the future reserves of oil will be. Already, the multinationals are going further offshore to deeper waters or Arctic regions. Uh, they're getting better at recovering oil, no fraction of oil, but uh, you also see that trend. So putting these things together, that the demand will be increasing and that you actually have to go to more challenging environments suggests that although the you know, price goes up, it goes down, it bobbles around, but in the long term, 10 and 20 years from today, uh, one has to expect that the price of oil will be higher, 
Now, having said that, the second part of your question was an excellent one. In order not to be whipsawed by this price of oil in this international market, you have to, as a country, we have to diversify our choice of energy for transportation. So what does that mean? It means first use the oil we need for transportation much more efficiently. Secondly, it means that when it's possible to electrify, as in personal vehicles, you should do this. Uh, we have a lot of natural gas. We want to look at whether it makes some sense to offload some of the energy to natural gas. And finally, there's biofuels and what I call next generation biofuels. Biofuels made from woody materials, cellulose type materials, uh, which aren't seen as a direct competition to food, require much less energy input. And again, the United States is blessed with incredible agricultural capacity, which also includes lumber waste. So biofuels can be a major part of it. So, so this is the way you diversify from just oil as the only solution. And that's what we need to do so that we minimize the economic impact going forward. Um, and it's, it's this four-part strategy, I think, that the President has spoken about very eloquently. We've got to continue this and uh, realize that the, over the long term, uh, the price of oil is likely to increase. Okay, one, one last question. Is this on? Okay. Yes, Secretary, I was wondering if you could speak to um, your or the department's stance on decentralized energy production and uh, possibilities for that in the future? I think, you know, having both centralized and decentralized is, is a real opportunity, especially with renewables, uh, especially photovoltaics, but even wind, uh, that you can put photovoltaics on a rooftop in a home, in a building, things of that nature, and with, you know, fairly modest energy storage, you can do a lot. Uh, that would also be, it's also great, by the way, for, um, for developing countries and people, and there are people in the United States who are off grid even today. People in Western Alaska are not connected to a, a central grid. And so to have renewable energy and energy storage to, to complement, let's say wind, to complement uh, how people in Western Alaska generate their electricity today, which is bunker fuels, you know, diesel fuel to run generators, very, very expensive. And going back to the price of oil, if in the future that price is going to just climb, you've got to develop these other methods. So, so decentralization is a good thing. Uh, you do want uh, a network in addition to that, so, so that just in case there's an outage here or there. So I think it's a combination of both centralized and decentralized that we see in the future. Okay, and so I think time is short, and so uh, I think... Uh, Bill, Master of Ceremonies, someone? We're, okay, thank you all and congratulations again to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. It's not every day you get to ask questions of the Secretary of Education. We appreciate the seminar. Energy, excuse me. Maybe he wears two hats. We also thank the young man for giving us the beauty shot of the morning, the handshake with the Secretary of Education. That's our money shot. The Secretary has to leave us, but he is going to stay long enough so that we can honor our two top performers today, the winners of the middle school and the high school divisions of the National Science Bowl. First, place middle school team will be receiving a trophy, a $1,000 check for their school science supplies. In addition, each team member will receive a Texas Instruments science calculator. Please join me in congratulating their first championship ever, Gale Ranch Middle School from San Ramon, California. California has always been well represented in the winner's circle up here. 
and Gail Rancher joining in that tradition. I think that check is non-negotiable. You'll get the real thing later, yes? Yeah. Thank you. And the winner of our high school championship besting the 69 high schools that are here for this long weekend. What a wonderful tribute. First place team gets a trophy, a thousand dollar check for their school supplies. And this, this is the best one. In addition, each student and coach will receive a two week science research trip to Australia. You're going down under Mira Loma High School from Sacramento. Mira Loma has been a past champion here on Science Bowl. Thank you guys for a, a morning of great drama. I know how satisfied you must be. Congratulations. Mira Loma, our high school champion. I almost got a souvenir, but the secretary decided to take that pad back with him. <laughs> All right. Our next awards are to the sites that have hosted regional science bowl events for 10 years. would like to present a plaque to the following organizations. Nobuche San Diego, represented by Bob Countryman. Bob, if you're here, could you please come on up and join us? Here he comes. Our next honoree, Redding Electric Company from Redding, California, represented today by Pam Brady. Pam, coming from behind the curtain over there. Thank you, Pam. The following organizations have coordinated regional science bowl events for 20 years almost the entire length of our existence here. Please join us on stage from B&W Pantex, Deborah Halliday. Deborah, come on out. <laughs> Joining us from the Kansas City plant, Representative Myra Everett, 20 years of sponsoring Science Bowl events. Thank you, Myra. Well, this wouldn't happen without you. Next, the National Energy Technology Laboratory in Morgantown, West Virginia, represented by Steve Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff. Our next honoree has been sitting over here monitoring all the events all morning. She comes from my hometown of Pittsburgh, the National Energy Technology Laboratory, sponsoring Science Bowl events for 20 years, Lila Sukup. Lila, come on up. And our last 20-year honoree comes from Sandia National Laboratory in California. Please welcome Annette Kitajima. Annette. Thank you for all you've done. Our next awards are for the middle schools. The middle school double elimination teams. You know who you are and now we're poised to recognize you properly. In addition to the first place team, the following teams finished in the top eight positions. This was out of 45 middle schools. You will receive $1,000 for your school science department and a plaque. Here they come first. 
from the Academy for Science and Design from Merrimack, New Hampshire. Their first year ever on Science Bowl. Come on up. Nice to have you guys here from New Hampshire, first year ever. That's right, be nice to Dr. Brinkman, he's the one with the check, that's it. Great smiles, make sure you come back and join us again next year, guys. Our next double elimination team also getting $1,000 for their school science department and a plaque, Marshall Middle School from Wexford, Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh. Come on up, Marshall Middle School. Looks a little apprehensive there. Come on up, everybody. Nice job. Marshall Middle School, Wexford, Pennsylvania, here in the nation's capital. Our next honoree, again, in the top eight out of 49 competitors, that would be Longfellow Middle School from Falls Church, Virginia, just a few miles from here. The Falls Church team, Longfellow Middle School, come on up. We have a check and a plaque for you. Nicely done. Nicely done. Longfellow Middle School. Our next school, the Lux Middle School from Lincoln, Nebraska. They are so anxious, they're walking out here already. Come on up. Lux Middle School. Congratulations, Lux. Our fourth, third, and second place winners, in addition to getting $1,000, also we have trophies for each of them. Our fourth place winner this year in our 21st year, a school that we've come to know here on Science World, Van Antwerp Middle School from Schenectady, New York. Van Antwerp, come on out. Nicely done. Is this the young man who asked the question of the secretary? Yes. Van Antwerp from Schenectady. Our third place team getting $1,000 in a trophy hails from Fremont, California. It's Hopkins Middle School. Hopkins. have to satisfy the paparazzi here, guys. That's it. Hopkins Middle School. And our second place winner, what a thrill they gave us this morning. They gave Gale Ranch a run for their money. Our second place winner, $1,000 in a trophy. Let's hear it for Shahela Middle School, Vancouver, Washington. There they are. Nicely done, guys. Nicely done.
Great job. Come back and see us next year. Our next awards go to the winners of the middle school hydrogen fuel cell car competition. Student teams were provided hydrogen fuel cells and motors to design, build, and race their model cars. The rest of the cars, such as the chassis, the transmission, the wheels, and the axles, were up to the creativity of you guys. One of the components to the competition is the speed race. Students race their cars on a 10-meter track to determine the fastest cars. The top three teams in the hydrogen fuel car race will receive a trophy. We have them right now. Third place car with a time of 4.01 seconds was built by the team from Ingemar Middle School from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ingemar. All right. Very good. Nicely done, guys. Our second place car, the second fastest and most furious, with a time of 3.84 seconds, was built by the team from Paducah Middle School from Paducah, Kentucky. Here they are, folks. Come on up. Great job to our second place team from Paducah. And the fastest of them all, the Speed Demons, they're waiting over there, our first place team, with a fast time of 3.49 seconds, the Blake Middle School from Hopkins, Minnesota. Congratulations, guys, on winning first place. There are just three awards that really nobody knows out there, except me. Two of them are the Civility Awards, and the third one is this one, the Car Engineering Design Award. Another component of this car competition was the Engineering Design Challenge. Each team had to document their construction and testing of the cars to create an engineering schematic that included the final specifications of the vehicle and scale drawings. And if that wasn't enough, the teams were also interviewed by a panel of engineering and science judges. The winning team was selected because they had the most innovative and complete engineering design journal. During the interview process, the team members demonstrated their strong knowledge of engineering skills, the design and building the car was clearly a coordinated team effort. They also showed great attention to detail and clearly understood hydrogen fuel cell technology and all the engineering concepts. This year's Car Engineering Design Award goes to a team that is here for the very first time. The best design document is from the home schools of Eastern Iowa from Walker, Iowa. Come on up and accept but is a very prestigious award. Homeschools of Eastern Iowa from Walker, Iowa. I see lots of smiles. Congratulations, guys. Nice trophy to take home with you. Congratulations. Next, we honor our high school double elimination teams. Each of the following teams advanced from the round robin tournament to the double elimination finals. Each of these teams, there are 16 total, receive a plaque and $1,000 for their school's science departments. Again, these are out of the 69 high school competitors, our 16. Our first school will go in alphabetical order. Amarillo High School from Amarillo, Texas. Amarillo, come on up. Amarillo, a perennial competitor here on Science Bowl for the past 21 years.
Amarillo High School. Nicely done, guys. We have a plaque and $1,000 for another team. This is their rookie year, first time at the National Science Bowl, the American Heritage School from Plantation, Florida. Come on up to the stage. What a nice debut you guys have made. The American Heritage School. Thank you, American Heritage. Our next honoree from Del Mar, New York, again, has been up on this stage many times, Bethlehem Central High School. Bethlehem. thousand dollars in a plaque to take back to Del Mar with you. Come back and join us again, guys. Our next double elimination team that we're honoring, a school with a beautiful name, Coeur d'Alene Charter Academy from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. There they are. Thank you, Cordeline. Nicely done. Our next high school, Fairview High School from Golden, Colorado. Fairview, come on up. The home of the youngsters with the interesting bios. Yes, if you haven't read them, make sure you do. Super job. Super job, Fairview. Next lined up to come up onto our stage here, the National Building Museum from Lincroft, New Jersey. Welcome High Technology High School. Here they are, High Technology. Thank you, High Technology. Congratulations to you. Next, from one of America's most historic towns, Lexington, Massachusetts, we welcome Lexington High School. One of the high school double elimination teams making it into the final 16. A plaque and $1,000 to take home to Massachusetts. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you here. Please come back. Next to school that has been here at the National Science Bowl for 12 years, a familiar competitor, Mission San Jose High School from Fremont, California. Thank you very much. Good to have you with us. They're followed by another California team, a past Science Bowl champion, here for 13 years, North Hollywood, North Hollywood High School. Thank you, North Hollywood. Hope to see you for 14 years next year. Next, the school that comes from a very important town as far as Department of Energy is concerned, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Welcome, Oak Ridge High School. There they are.
All right, on the, on the applause meter, Oak Ridge, I think you're winning. You've got some friends out there. Oak Ridge High School, ladies and gentlemen. Next, hailing from Exeter, New Hampshire, Phillips Exeter Academy. Here they are. New Hampshire has been well represented in the winner's circle here today. Nice to have Phillips Exeter as part of that group. And our final team before we get into the last of our honorees is Wyzata High School from Plymouth, Minnesota, their first year at Science Bowl. Wyzata High School. Thank you, Wyzata. A nice debut your school has made as well. We have three more high schools to recognize. Our fourth place team, in addition to receiving the $1,000, will also get a trophy. We please welcome Hunter College High School from New York. Hunter College. A double winner today. Lots to take home with you. Good job, guys. Great weekend for you. Great weekend. But this time, joining, I'd like to have joined Dr. Brinkman on the stage, Captain Darren Long from the United States Air Force. The Air Force, as we mentioned a while back, is a sponsor here at Science Bowl for the very first time this year. We are so happy to have them here. The third place team will receive a trophy, $1,000 for science supplies. In addition, each student on the third place team will receive a $500 scholarship from the United States Air Force. That is significant. And we thank you, Captain Long, for that. And we welcome Sunset High School from Portland, Oregon. Sunset, come on up. Great achievement, and thank you, Captain Long. I know you guys are going to put good, put that money to very good use. Thousand dollars for the school, five hundred dollars for each of our players. Great job. And our second place team will also be receiving a trophy. $1,000 for science supplies, and each student on this second place team will receive a $750 scholarship from the United States Air Force, a past champion, and what a tremendous morning you gave us. You came ever so close to repeating as champ. A wonderful team from just up the road in Silver Spring, Montgomery Blair. Montgomery Blair, great team. Represent the spirit of Science Bowl, the way you cooperated, the way you handled yourself on stage. Tremendous work, Montgomery Blair. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Our final two awards, again, these are two that nobody knows until now. The Civility Award, for those of you that are here for the very first time, people have been watching you throughout this weekend. It's not just your scholarship, but your sportsmanship and your manners that have been under the microscope. If you've been kind to your neighbors, 
and you are genuinely concerned about everyone here, people took notice. So the Civility Award demonstrates not just academic involvement, but good sportsmanship. Our middle school winner. This year's winner gets a trophy. Each team member will receive a Watson gift bag, courtesy of IBM, a Kindle, and a $100 Amazon gift card. Not bad. Not bad. A lot of bling here. This team was extremely respectful, they tell me, to all the officials, coaches, and parents, and other competitors. When they lost, they were gracious losers. When they won, they always commended the other players on the opposing team, and they would appreciate the knowledge of the other players and compliment them. This team has competed with dignity and respect throughout the National Science Bowl. That counts for a lot. The winning team of the 2011 Middle School National Science Bowl Civility Award, we've already seen them. Homeschools of Eastern Iowa from Walker, Iowa. Come on back up. A winning weekend for you here in your first year ever on National Science Bowl. Thanks for all you did to make it nice for everybody here this weekend. Let's give them another round of applause. Congratulations. Homeschools of Eastern Iowa. The gift card, the Kindle, the IBM Watson gift bag. There are lots of goodies to take home here. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Nice hand for our homeschool students from Walker, Iowa. One last award. You've been a great audience. I know you're anxious to make your way home and to have lunch, but this is, this is one of the biggest awards that we have because, again, it represents who you are, not just as students, but as people. The winner of the 2011 High School Science Bowl Civility Award will attend a science research trip in Alaska. You're going to the land of the midnight sun. The team will also receive a trophy, and each team member gets a Watson gift bag courtesy of IBM. They tell me this team was just known throughout this whole weekend for their professional manner during the competitions. They were courteous to a fault in explaining the competition rules to their opponents, and they got excited and they were passionate for the game, whether they were winning or losing. Just the kind of school we want to have here, and we appreciate so much. They even organized and ran a fun on-campus activity for other teams and even provided the pizzas. Boy, you can't go wrong if you feed the people. The winning team, this is their third year at National Science Bowl, hails from Goleta, California, Dos Pueblos High School. Dos Pueblos. trying to milk the moment by walking around the crowd here. <laughs> Come on up to the stage, guys.
Francisco. Our Civility Award winners, Dos Pueblos, Galita, California. Another fine team from California, again, always well represented on our stage here. Great job, everybody. Great job. Before we dismiss you, what I'd like to do, and we've not given them proper credit, could we have all of the coaches and sponsors and teachers stand up that brought your students here? Can we see who you are? They're all amazing. So proud of all that you've done. Thank you. Could not do it without you. Jen, is there anything else? We have any more awards to give away? Anybody who'd like an award that didn't get one? <laughs> yeah. Yes. The Department of Energy we just wants to thank all of you, all of the coaches, families, everybody for all you've done, and all the volunteers that are out there. Where are all the Department of Energy volunteers? They've been running around. Can we see you? Or are they all working somewhere? Right up front here. Let's give the DOA a hand for all they did. It's been a long morning, but I hope you've had a good time, and I hope you go back and you talk about what happened here, and we hope to see you again next year. And just to reiterate, before you forget all that's happened, when you're sitting on that plane flying home, make sure you let Jan and all these people know what this meant to you. Thank you very much. Of applause for David Zarin, who's taken his morning to help us out. And once more for Dr. Brinkman, who gave out all those checks. Okay, now for the dismissal. Um, we're going to dismiss by luggage tag color, but before that, I want to personally thank each of you for making this a great year for all of us that worked here. So thank you guys, keep in touch, and uh, please come back next year. We hope to see you next year.